With three albums and five top ten hits, Jim Croce established himself as the voice of America's working class. Well, the south side of Chicago is a better part of town. And if you go down there, you better just be aware of a man named Leroy Brown. Croce was one of these guys who told our story. When we heard songs like Time in a Bottle, when we heard, you know, uh, Leroy Brown or something like that, he was reminding us in verse who we were and what made us so special. Yes, he was better than a whole gang called and meaner than a junkyard dog. What appeared to be Jim Croce's overnight success took a lifetime to achieve. When he finally became a superstar and hit the road, his private life paid the price. He belonged to the road. He was no longer ours anymore. Life became an abrupt, abrupt and lonely place for me. And just as Jim decided that being home was more important than living on the road, his life came to a tragic end. And I thought, man, you know, what a shame. How, how does it happen like this? When Jim Croce died in a tragic plane crash at the age of 30, he left behind a two-year-old baby boy who would never know his father, and a devastated wife who always knew that time wasn't on their side. I guess there was a sense that I had from the minute that I met Jim that it couldn't last forever. Tonight, a VH1 exclusive, the triumph and the tragedy of Jim Croce. I would be happy just to hold the hands of The world gained a new folk hero this year. You don't pull off the Lone Ranger's mask, you don't tug on Superman's cape, and you sure don't want to mess around with Big Jim Croce. Uptown got its hostas. The year was 1973, and Jim Croce was at the height of his career. After years of playing in dive bars, struggling to make ends meet, this ordinary man was finally on his way to becoming an extraordinary star. You don't pull the mask off the old Lone Ranger and you don't mess around with Jim. It was a balmy evening in the bayou, and Jim Croce had just finished a concert in Natchitoches, Louisiana. He put on a show that was beyond belief. The people there, I mean, he must have had three encores that night. As his chartered plane lifted off, the twin-engine Beechcraft suddenly slammed into a row of pecan trees at the end of the runway. Within seconds, Jim Croce and five other people on board were dead. I had a lot of anger when Jim died. I had a lot of anger. I missed him terribly, and I was angry at him, and I was angry that he had died, and I was angry at the whole business. Now, close to 25 years later, the original landing strip has been replaced, and the pecan trees have been cut down. What remains is the music and the poetry of Jim Croce. This is his story through the eyes of the people who knew him best. His wife Ingrid, his blue-collar buddies, and closest friends Cheech Marin and Arlo Guthrie. I don't know that he saw himself as being that unique. He saw himself as being a regular guy. And in those days, that really meant something. Yeah, well, the streets are all pretty part of his blood, I think, you know, and uh, it's part of mine as well. And it was, it was uh, exciting for us, it's sort of titillating to be out on the streets. And you know, we'd close places, we'd stay up till it got light, and I really miss that. I really, really miss that. Well, Jim's uh, slogan that he used a lot is, if you dig it, do it, and if you dig it a lot, do it twice. But there was a serious side to Jim Croce, his music. Jim's earliest influences came from his family. The Croce's were a close-knit clan from South Philadelphia. Music was a major part of their lives, and they always seem to be singing and dancing. Something tells me that you and I should get together. By the time Jim was a teenager, anyone who came in contact with him couldn't help but notice that this kid could sing. In this recording from an early 1950s church talent show, it was obvious that Jim Croce was a born entertainer, a natural. Cause your mother knows you're out to be. He sang to please people, but he also sang because it 
gave him an incredible joy. He would play music 20 hours a day, fall asleep and wake up and play more. That was what he lived for. Jim was the first in his family to go to and graduate from college. He paid for his education by juggling a part-time job, driving a truck and playing in a band. Uh, I've spent about 10, 11 years playing in bars, playing at parties, fraternity parties, doing uh, rock and roll, country and western, bluegrass, just about every different kind of music you can think of. While at Villanova University, Jim landed a job as a disc jockey at the school's radio station. One of the queens of all-time blues singing was Miss Bessie Smith. Charlie Green, won't you play that thing? It was there where Jim could play the music that his father played for him while he was growing up. I know the, blows of horn. the lyrical tales of Pennsylvania miners and farmers. The hard luck stories of working class heroes. If Jim wasn't playing or performing music, he was listening to it, especially folk music. And that's what drew him to a local hootenanny where he met a young singer named Ingrid Jacobson. I fell madly in love. I couldn't even imagine that life had ever existed before he walked into that room with that guitar. The year was 1963, Ingrid was 16, Jim 19. They fell in love and after a three-year courtship were married. I mean, when you meet someone and you're 16 and you're madly in love, you're at a time in your life where your hormones are, are running your life, you know, and everything's emotional. Fueled by that emotion, Jim and Ingrid embarked on their musical journey together, madly in love, but absolutely penniless. It was the 60s, and it was a great time to be you and me against the world. We found out as we went along that it really was us against odds. The odds of a young husband and wife team from Philly making their mark in the music business were astronomical. But the Croches were young, talented, and they were willing to take the gamble. Moving me down the highway. When we return, the Croches learn about the music business the hard way. He didn't spend time in perhaps learning about what the business was about, as well as he could have, which ended up ultimately getting him and us in a lot of trouble. Then, how adversity inspired unforgettable music. His songs had an instant depth to him, an instant life to him, because he, you know, his life wasn't easy. When Behind the Music continues. It was early 1970, and Jim and Ingrid Croce had been married for four years. After their wedding, they sang their way up and down the East Coast, finally settling in New York. But after their first and only record together didn't sell, the couple abandoned the big city. We were sitting at our house, and he was trying to figure out ways to make money, because we just kind of knew that music wasn't the way we could make money. Don't you know that I gotta get out of here, cause New York's not my home. I'm Jim Croce. I live here. Jim and Ingrid escaped to a tiny farmhouse apartment in the rural Pennsylvania town of Lindale. This 1973 documentary provides a rare glimpse of the Croce's life on the farm. You know, I've lived in a lot of different places, lived in cities, lived around the suburbs, and I really like living in the country. The apartment was cheap and close to the small bars Jim needed to perform in to make a buck. But as he would recall later, there was more to performing in those bars than just playing music. It was self-defense. And you work right on the floor and they got you surrounded in a little chicken wire cage. So nobody hurts you with stuff that's flying through the air. <laughs> One thing I've learned though is the guitar is really a great instrument of self-defense, you know. <laughs> Life was difficult for the Croches, but things were about to get worse. Like many struggling artists, Jim was anxious to make it big. While recording in New York, Jim signed a series of contracts with representatives who promised to promote him and his music. It was a deal the Croches would later regret. If you have a talent and um, a passion for making music as often as much as you can, you're not thinking about the business end of what's going on in life. Music in those days was not a business. It would have been interesting to see what he would have done 
when he would have figured that out. I'm a dreamer by nature, and I've always been. Ingrid says Jim was angry that others were profiting from his music while he received almost nothing. Jim was on the verge of walking away from the music business. She says he was convinced that there was only one way left to make money off his guitars. He was bartering and selling off all his guitars, just something to be able to make money. It was never, it was never going to happen, it seemed, that music would be the thing that would help us to survive financially. Music was going to have to be something that brought us a lot of joy, but it just didn't seem like we could ever make it in the, in the music business. Jim loved to perform, but making $25 a night wasn't enough to support he and Ingrid. So by the summer of 1970, he was forced to take odd jobs just to make ends meet. He drove a truck, taught guitar, and became a construction worker. He would got in with the truck drivers and then uh, the cement pourers, and then they would take him out on weekends and he'd go to the roller derby and he'd go to, uh, let's see, Rapid Roy or the tattoo parlors. Jim would tuck away his blue collar experiences in his memory. He would one day write and sing about them. They would one day make him a star. He's got a tattoo on his arm and say, baby, he's got another one to just say, hey. But every Sunday afternoon he is a dirt track demon in his 57 Chevrolet. Melvin Goldfield was one of Jim's closest friends during those years. Melvin saw firsthand how Jim could turn a mundane moment into a classic song. Well, we're standing in front of this old, old uh, funky gate, you know, that locked this junk, this old junkyard, and they kept the dog, you know, to protect the junkyard. And the dog was trained to come, like, be ferocious. I think they fed him gunpowder to make the dogs really beastly, you know. And uh, it would, its paws and its mouth would be under the, under the gate trying to get whoever was near or near the gate. And uh, I said, man, this is about a mean junkyard dog, you know. I guess he just found it was a good line for a song. You know? Jim was famous for collecting friends. Rarely a night went by when he didn't bring someone home to stay at the farm. Jim had this wonderful ability to invite people that were uh, in juxtaposition in life. He would love to invite a priest and somebody from, you know, the Ku Klux Klan and somebody from uh, Roller Derby Queen and maybe somebody who would come um, oh, from a college professor and he would, and, and then a lot of young girls that were really pretty and and uh, brought a lot of color to the party. Jim and Ingrid's parties became legendary. Old friends, family, and a fraternity of struggling musicians would come to eat, drink, and play music. The Croce's little farmhouse became a musical commune full of people who would one day become legends. Bonnie Raitt, James Taylor, Jimmy Buffett, Randy Newman, and Arlo Guthrie. It was just a part of my life that's sort of like a blur now. And I don't know because of, if that's because we were doing things we shouldn't have been doing or something, you know. We have homemade dandelion wine, and we'd sit there and just get high and happy and, and enjoy the experience of, you know, listening to one person, hey, I got this great new song, and James Taylor would play a song for you. We were young, and we were free, and it didn't matter. And not only that, we didn't care. And uh, we could have cared less if, if people were making money or not making money. We were having so much fun. And we were living so high off the hog. And I don't mean with driving fancy cars and stuff. I mean, we were like, we were dancing through life. But even with all this music, all this inspiration, Jim Croce was in turmoil. He left songs half finished and abandoned his dreams. Because of the contract he had signed, Jim knew he'd see little of the profit made from his music. He didn't feel safe in writing. He was very scared that if he wrote something that he had to deal with the people up in New York, which he realized were not his friends. So he kind of swore off writing for a year because he was afraid if he did anything that they would take it. Nevertheless, Jim believed that somehow, some way, things would work out. Ingrid wasn't so sure. I was always, from the very beginning, very concerned about well, wait a minute, we're playing this gig, but we don't have any money to get there. How are we going to do this? Well, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, it'll work out. For years, it always did seem to work out. 
They had always managed to make ends meet when it was just the two of them. But the stakes were about to get higher. In December of 1970, Ingrid told Jim that she was pregnant. The look on his face was sheer terror. There was this, this elation of the idea of immortality that came over him in the sense of the Croce name being carried on, but there was also the sense of responsibility that was about as far away from Jim's mind at that time than he could imagine. Whether it was the fear of becoming a father or the new responsibility of having to provide for a family, a fire was ignited inside Jim Croce. He sat down at the kitchen table and began to write all of the stories he had heard, all of his life's experiences that he'd been saving, all of his creative juices finally began to flow. In a single week, Jim Croce composed a lifetime's worth of music. Operator, New York's Not My Home, Don't Mess Around with Jim, Rapid Roy, Photographs and Memories, and a song dedicated to his unborn child, Time in a Bottle. If I could save time in a bottle. I think with Jim recognizing uh, the birth of his own child, there was a sense of mortality that that inclined him to write a song about immortality in a sense it, it was a it was a turning over of his own life into another life you're the one i want to go through time with jim was about to have a family he needed to make money so he swallowed his pride returned to new york and began recording jim croce had new music with a new message don't mess around with jim the thing that really made Time in a Bottle, or You Don't Mess Around with Jim, come alive was the sense of the gift of giving this to someone that was going to be really important in his life. For eight months, Jim would split his time between recording in New York and being at home on the farm. Jim was preparing for what he saw as the two greatest accomplishments of his life, his son and his first solo album. Next, Jim Croce's career takes off. Of a man named Leroy Brown. I came out with that first hit, boom, Leroy Brown, top of the charts, uh, operator, top of the charts. Uh, I have to tell you I love it. Boom, boom, boom. It was like he was firing rockets off, you know? And later, Jim hits the road, and Ingrid struggles to keep the family together. Life became an abrupt, abrupt and lonely place for me. When Behind the Music returns. In September of 1971, Jim Croce was a proud dad, and he was singing his way to stardom. I've got a name, I've got a name. That screaming you're hearing back in there is my little boy, Adrian James, uh, trying to sing, do something. Uh, let me call my wife and come out here. Hey, why don't you bring him out? One week after A.J. Croce was born, Jim hit the road. He had a family to support and a new album to promote. And from that time on, he belonged to the road. He was no longer ours anymore. He went on the road and he performed probably over 300 concerts a year. And uh, life became an abrupt, abrupt and lonely place for me. Jim's album was about to shoot up the charts. He had turned the colorful characters and experiences from his blue collar days into his first gold album. But Ingrid says she and Jim were still living on a working man's wage. It was kind of like the business was holding out this carrot and they had him running after this carrot and they kept saying, well, the money's gonna come, the check's in the mail. Jim may not have been seeing big money from his record sales or concert appearances, but he was earning the respect of thousands of fans. He and his best friend and guitar player, Maury Muehlheisen, were starting to fill stadiums. Their folk rock sound was catching on. Jim was becoming the kind of celebrity that celebrities wanted to see. When I sat down on the show, and he just proceeded to just knock me out, man. Yeah. Cheech Marin of Cheech and Chong fame became fast friends with Jim Croce after meeting him backstage at a concert. His music was incredible. He was funny. He captivated the audience. He and just two guys, and him and Murray together. Uh, and he was singing all that, and it was really deep songs, and songs that were way different from Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. You know, that was his, like, you know, his, his uh, top 40 commercial hit. By the end of 1972, Jim Croce had made it to the brink of superstardom. Bad, Bad Leroy Brown was about to claim the number one spot on the charts, and Operator wasn't far behind. Yeah, I came out with that first hit, boom, 
Leroy Brown, top of the charts. Uh, Operator, top of the charts. Uh, I have to tell you I love you some. Boom, boom, boom. It was like he was firing rockets off, you know? He'd gotten huge. Um, he'd gotten really huge. Operator, well, could you help me place this car? And while Jim and his partner Maury were traveling the world, Ingrid and Maury's girlfriend, Judy Coffin, were feeling isolated back on the farm, trying to cope with the loneliness. It was a very taxing on um, one's ability to keep your house and home together and uh, keep your life balanced when you realize that all this traveling was going on and they were meeting people that you didn't know and making connections and having relationships with people that you only heard about maybe secondhand. And um, you knew that they were stressed out in their lives. And it, it was just a crazy life of big contrasts, extremes. But in looking back at the places I've been, the changes that I've left behind. For Jim, life on the road was exhausting and exhilarating. He loved experiences both good and bad. The hard way every time. And on the road, there were plenty of both. Jim Croce was a long way from the farm. I don't think Jim was any different than anybody else on the road. I think that it was, like I said, a fraternity of musicians that had their own way of enjoying their lives. People did have a lot of opportunity to dabble in things that would take them to places they couldn't get on their own. Have a good time, and yeah, I mean, that's a musician's life anyways, you know, especially if you're on the road, which he always was and we always were, you know. That's funny, because we used to meet, we never met each other in L.A., very seldom. We'd always meet each other in New York or Chicago or something. Oh, and it was always like, oh, and you have an old friend that was in town. By early 1973, Ingrid missed her husband terribly. She had been home alone, raising her son for over a year. To make matters worse, Ingrid was hearing Jim's songs on the radio and seeing him on television. Still, they had very little money. When Jim returned to the country for a one-week vacation, Ingrid confronted him. The dollar thing started to come in, and I said, Jim, I don't understand, you know, what is going on? You're working like a crazy person on the road, and you don't have any, we don't have any more money than we had when we were singing college concerts two years ago. And, you know, he said, I know, I just, I don't want to talk about it. It's all going to be okay. And, you know, and I would press. And that's something that I learned you didn't do with Jim, especially after having been on the road. After confronting Jim, Ingrid broke down. She felt isolated and alone. I laid in bed and cried that night. I was very, very upset. I'd missed him so much. And there were so many things that we couldn't discuss because everything, Everything was stopped if you asked a question. And he went downstairs and he started to play and, and like he always did, pick up a guitar and wrote, I'll have to say I love you in a song. And the next morning he came upstairs early in the morning and sang it to me. Jim was unable to really express himself when he talked to you. Um, he was a great listener. But he didn't, he didn't bear his soul to many people. Every time I try to tell you, the words just came out wrong. So I have to say I love you in a song. He had one of those uh, faces that when you looked into his eyes, you realize the guy had lived. You know, the guy, there was pain in his songs. They, they were funny and they were warm. They were wonderful because of the life he had lived. It was August of 1973. Jim and Ingrid knew that things had to change. They had to get better. So in an attempt to escape the isolation and loneliness of the farm, they decided to start a new life in California. The Croches packed up everything they owned and moved to San Diego. Well, I always just wanted it normal. I mean, I, I tried to t move to a place in San Diego called Normal Heights just to get normal. Despite the move, Jim was still constantly on the road. His long absences were taking a terrible toll on the marriage. Jim Croce took a hard look at his life and decided it was time to stop. We were looking at a photo of Jim that um, a friend of ours had taken. It was the ultimate photo of Jim. It showed Jim in the Jim Croce that everybody knew and loved. And he looked at that picture, and he saw the wrinkles around his eyes, and he saw his 
mustache and it was kind of scraggly and the cigar in his hand. He said, oh my God, look how old I look. And he couldn't really believe that life had gone by so quickly. Jim Croce sat down and wrote a letter. Dear friends, my cup got so full it overflowed and I had to empty it to really learn about life and what it means to me. He wrote the letter to Ingrid. He wrote it to his friends. He wrote it to himself. I now want to be the oldest man in the world with a face full of wrinkles, of wisdom, and a lot of cross-the-board buddies. One thing I don't want to become is intense. It's the first 60 years that count, and I've got 30 to go. Be cool, Jim. Jim and Ingrid spent one final night together before he left for what he promised would be his last concert tour. They walked the streets of San Diego. Jim and Ingrid talked about all the things they had done together. They talked about the difficulties. They talked about their son. But mostly, they talked about their future. He was ready to get out of the business. He hated it so much. He hated the touring and, and the, oh, the, the contriving of of all the things that were part of the business and the lies and, and the pretense of all the things that had been promised to him over the years about how he was going to make money and how it was all going to be okay. Jim and Ingrid had no way of knowing that that walk together would be their last. Next, the day Jim Croce died. I picked up the phone and it was my stepmother. She said there was a plane crash. And I said, and Jim's dead, right? She said, yes. And later, Ingrid goes back to where it all began. Gosh, I remember standing in that window, in that door, when AJ was born. When Behind the Music returns. Isn't that the way they say it goes? By early September of 1973, Jim Croce was more famous than he had ever imagined. He had three hits on the top of the charts, and with the single Time in a Bottle about to be released, Jim's music would become more popular than ever. But that's not the way it feels. Wherever we went, people recognized Jim's music and they recognized Jim, and, and it did. It happened, I think, for the most part, for people overnight. With a renewed lease on life, Jim was intent on completing his six-month road trip, and then he planned to return home to his wife and child for good. From the county prison doing 90 days for non-support Tried to find me an executive position But no matter how smooth I talked He wouldn't listen to the fact that I was a genius On his final road trip, Jim played to packed houses across the country. He was a star now. Far too big to play a small gig in rural Natchitoches, Louisiana. But Jim Croce was a man of his word. Jim never canceled a tour, so he was determined, even though he was going to lose money on the gig, to do this job. One year before Jim hit it big, he had been forced to cancel a performance at Northwestern State University in Louisiana due to an illness. Unable to sing, he had promised the promoters that he would make up the show as soon as he could. This was his chance to fulfill that promise. You can imagine having had um, planned on bringing Jim Croce in when he was an unknown and finding that a year later he was this big star with you know two songs on the top of the charts and you're getting him for $750 to bring to your college buddies I mean they were pretty excited I mean he enjoyed the ride in my convertible that afternoon like a 16 year old I mean it was a grin from ear to ear like how sweet is life Doug Nichols was a student at Northwestern State University and the concert's promoter. He will never forget the day he and Jim Croce met on this runway. It was a good feeling. Truthfully, I was there for one reason. He's a celebrity. Hey, let's face it, who don't want to meet a celebrity? And I mean, I have booked it. We were spending money. He was a star. The date was September 20th, 1973. Jim planned to play this concert, finish the tour, then he would go home for good. And Ingrid couldn't wait for him to get there. I was being a mom. I was taking care of a young young man who was two years old and wanting to run everywhere all over the, the grounds and, and get into everything. Like he had done so many times before, Jim Croce picked up his dressing room phone and called his wife. 
And I picked up the phone and he said, hiing. And we talked and I said, Jim, I gotta run, I gotta go. And I never did this on a phone because it was just always so great when he'd call. I want to hear everything that was happening. But it was one of these things where I felt, you know what, he's going to be back. So we're going to have time. Jim Croce left Ingrid with one final message. And there was a pause and he said, I love you. And that was the last time that I spoke to Jim. A Jim Croce concert in Little Natchitoches, Louisiana was a big deal. Prather Coliseum on the campus of Northwestern held an audience a fraction of the size Jim was used to playing for. But that didn't phase Jim Croce. He had his guitar, and he was ready to play. He played his heart out brought the few that were there to their feet more than once. I went to sleep that night, and I remember looking in the mirror. Uh, and when I looked in the mirror, I saw behind me this photograph of Jim that we had been looking at together. And before I went to sleep that night, I kept I kept thinking of all the things that were going to happen in our lives and all the, the things that we wanted to, to see to fruition. And I laid down and I couldn't sleep that night. I, kept, I had this dream and it kept going over and over and over and around in my head. It was almost as if in this dream, this whole thing that was going around and around in my dream was kind of like the end of the record. This may very well be the last photo ever taken of Jim Croce. He had closed his show with an encore performance of Time in a Bottle. And despite the small crowd, Jim Croce was on an emotional high. Jim and Maury climbed aboard their chartered plane. They buckled in, the engines started, and the plane began to taxi. Jim Croce was headed to another show in Texas, but he would never arrive. Jim Croce would never see his wife or his child again. About four o'clock in the morning, uh, the phone rang. And I picked up the phone, and it was my, my stepmother. And she said to me, are you all right? And I said, yes. And she said, there was a plane crash. I was just watching the Today Show, and there was a plane crash. And I said, and Jim's dead, right? She said, yes, everyone on the plane died. I said, Doug, Jim's plane's gone down. Don't look like there's no survivors. And I said, his plane can't go down. I just shook his hand and put him on the plane. As the plane had begun its takeoff, one of its wings clipped a tree. It's like the plane never gained enough height coming off the runway to go over the top of the pecan trees. Jim Croce, his friend Maury, and four others aboard the twin-engine Beechcraft were killed instantly. News of the tragedy spread quickly. It was one of those moments when you go, what? <laughs> it's like, it's not real. And uh, I don't remember what I was doing. I just remember somebody said, you know, Jim Croce just died. And it was like, huh? That can't be. 
And uh, I thought somebody was kidding. I thought somebody was just making it up. You know, another one of those disasters, you know, like, you know, there had been a few people that had been killed that way and, you know, and planes going down or something, but that was rock and roll people. I mean, <laughs> it didn't happen to folk singer types. I was, um, I was about to step on stage. I can't remember where it was. Someplace. Uh, I, I, and we were just standing outside the auditorium or in the little waiting area, you know, when we were ready to go on. Somebody came and said, hey, did you hear this news? Jim Croce died in a plane crash. And I went, what? And then the guy says, okay, you guys, you're on. I swear to God, it just happened that quick. I went, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this later. And I went on and I did the show. And I, and I, and I, had, I just had to do the show and it came off and I went, whoa. He wasn't ready for this. You know, he should be here. He wasn't ready for that day. Ingrid, in the meantime, had to explain to her two-year-old son that his father wasn't coming home. I told him right away. I don't know if he understood it, but he seemed to understand it. And I think that was, without question for me, the saddest part of it all. Um, I just wanted so much for AJ to have a family. Less than one month after Jim's death, Time in a Bottle hit number one on the Billboard charts, and three of his albums would eventually make it to the top 10. Jim Croce may have been gone, but his music wouldn't let us forget him. It wasn't long, maybe a month or, or two after he had died, that it was, it was like Jim Croce was the only thing on, on the radio. And all of a sudden, everybody was singing his songs. You'd hear his music everywhere. It was a big deal when he died because he was going up and he wasn't leveled off. He wasn't going down. And when somebody's going up, we all have expectations, and the world had expectations. People had things happening for him, you know. Next, Ingrid struggled to win back control of her husband's music. I've always felt that people need to fight for things that they believe in. And A.J. Croce. A legacy lives on. Jim Croce's legacy is his music. His son and his music. Anything. When Behind the Music continues. Billy Joel on fame. It's an upside and a downside. The good. The upside is I've been really, really fortunate. The bad. The downside is I got taken advantage of. And the really ugly. There were millions and millions of dollars that were just gone. Billy Joel tells his story on the next VH1 Behind the Music. Shocked the hell out of me. VH1 Behind the Music. Don't you know I had a dream last night that you were here with me? It took me many, 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 many years to except that Jim was gone. Oh, when I woke up on the dream, it was gone. Gone since 1973, Jim Croce's stamp on the American music scene is immeasurable. And so is his impact on those who loved him. Decades later, the memories of those who were close to Jim Croce haven't faded. Gosh, I remember standing in that window, in that door, when AJ was born. This is Ingrid Croce's first trip back to the little farmhouse where she and Jim shared their life together. It's really pretty much the same in a lot of ways, you know. This is the old outhouse. Still standing are the structures of Jim Croce's past. This is where virtually all of the photos of Jim and Ingrid's life together were taken. From the brick wall where Jim stood tall, to the grassy field where the Croce's posed for their family photo, to the famous outhouse window that appeared on his first album cover. Well. It's probably not in as good condition as it was in when we were here, but not too much worse. <laughs> it's neat. Take a look in there. Jim was going to make that an office, if you can imagine. As for A.J. Croce, he's a musician and songwriter with a record deal. And like his dad, A.J.'s got a style that's very much his own. You said you miss me awful bad. But A.J. says he can't help but be influenced by his dad's songwriting. The thing that I love most about his music was the storytelling. It's the key to what I do. People come up to me 
often and tell me how moved they were uh, by his music and, and um, I can't tell you the number of people that have come to me and said that they remember the day that he died. After Jim's death, Ingrid went to court and fought for the right to examine the financial records pertaining to Jim's career. Ingrid Croce was determined to discover how much money Jim's music had generated. I've always felt that people need to fight for things that they believe in. It was, it was very, very important to me to understand why Jim had to have been away so long and doing the things that he did. After years of litigation, Ingrid is finally confident that she is receiving the money she and Jim worked so hard for. But even now, Ingrid has little good to say about the music business of that era. It wasn't a time when people's lives were really valued, um, at least not in the industry that I was part of. It took Ingrid Croce years to come to grips with the loss of her husband. Today she is remarried and operates a restaurant dedicated to the memory of Jim. Located smack dab in the heart of San Diego, Croce's is on the same street where Jim and Ingrid took their final walk together. It is there she displays the many reminders of her life with Jim. As Ingrid looks back, however, it is the first song he ever sang to her that puts it all in perspective. This recording has never before been made public. And I'm just a country boy. Money have I not? The song is called I'm Just a Country Boy. It tells the story of a simple man with no money, but an abundance of love. Jim Croce was not a simple man, but his dreams were. He looked for happiness and found it in making others happy. In a sense, Jim Croce wrote the soundtrack for his own life. And in the process, with each note, each lyric, each story, we all learned a little something about ourselves. All I could afford is a loving heart the only one I own. He picked out all of the heroes and the heroines, all of the people, all of the things that make our lives rich and unique and and you realize that in everyday life you don't have to be a Hollywood hero. You don't have to be a fiction. You don't have to be made up. There are there are fabulous characters everywhere and he had an eye for picking them out he knew he was one of them well I think the Jim Croce legacy probably rests within a lot of individuals in their own hearts uh, fortunately his music is, is spread out and lots of people enjoy his music but him the man I think uh, sort of just a personal gratitude to, to have been a friend of his I think he believed every word he said when you when he said if you dig it do it and if you dig it a lot do it twice he did it thousands of times. He did it as many times as he could to make himself feel alive. But I've got silver in the stars, gold in the morning sun, gold in the morning sun. Living in L.A. with my best old ex-friend, Ray. Guys, she said she knew... Twenty years ago, Leif Garrett was a teen idol. He drove all the girls crazy, and he drove his car off a cliff, crippling his best buddy and killing their friendship. Now, for the first time in 20 years, Leif and his friend are reunited on VH1 Behind the Music, Leif Garrett. Tonight at 9, 8 central on VH1's Teen Idols Week. Overcome the blow, learn to take it well I only wish my words could just convince myself That it just wasn't real But that's not the way it feels